<laughs> I mean, I mean, you'll uh, you'll talk to <laughs> her very soon. <laughs> You're welcome to right now if you want to. Hi, everybody. Uh, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, it just so happens that that prayer time is like right overlapping with the very beginning of this. So uh, Imam Jamal will be just a couple minutes late. Um, feel free to uh, talk amongst yourselves beforehand if you like. Think about the questions you might have about this if you have um, looked into anything about this and uh, we'll have a good time. going to play some slides for a moment and then uh, I'll kind of introduce everybody. I thought you I thought you said you're going to play some music for a moment. <laughs> I mean I could I, you know what what do you want to hear? Some No. No. <laughs> I take a bus. Slides are good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. I I probably won't. Um so I, I firstly just want to welcome everybody to this program. Um, and I am not exactly sure when Imam Dumo will be here, but he should be here pretty soon, five minutes he's in. And um, I, I want to introduce you to uh, to this program. So this is a program that we, uh, we kind of rebranded in some way. So uh, we used to have more than a joke in person. Um, and, uh, you know, being a clergy panel and everything. And this year, um, we thought that the name didn't quite fit anymore. Uh, so we decided to, to shift it a little bit. And uh, tonight's program will basically, will focus on um, Imam Jamal's teaching about prophethood. And uh, there will be a conversation between uh, the clergy and, and Rebecca, who's a future clergy, um, and and then we'll we'll have some Q and A. And um, I really want this to be an organic experience for uh, for everyone. You know, this is this is um, sort of interfaith dialogue in action. Um, but how many of you have have heard of prophethood before? Uh, particularly if you're not uh, Muslim, <laughs> that's too easy, Abdul. <laughs> Has anyone, has anyone who is not Muslim heard of prophethood? And that is why I asked uh, Imam Jamal to make sure to pick a, a, a good example from, um, yeah. from the Islamic scriptures. That's why I'm here to learn. Yes. So like, oh, I don't know this, I need to. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, one thing, um, yeah, it's, it's important for us to both uh, you know, find these commonalities, but also recognize and appreciate the differences that we do have. And, and we have an opportunity with um, looking at various teachings, various uh, people within the traditions to be able to do that. Um, well, maybe what I'll, I'll have uh, happen first here, if, if you don't mind, um, introducing yourself, uh, Imam Jamal's joining, but uh, Rabbi Dina, would you uh, just quickly introduce yourself, and then Rebecca, and then and then uh, we will pass it off to Imam Jamal to get started after that. Sure. Hi, I'm Rabbi Dina Barazin. I am the associate rabbi at Temple Israel, and I have been in Omaha for five, a little over five years now. And um, love getting to, to learn with all of you. So I am excited to learn with you guys tonight because I this is a prophet that I don't know as much about. 
Um, and so I'm eager to learn from, from Imam Jamal and engage in some dialogue and find the commonalities. Thank you. Rebecca? Hello, I am Rebecca Morello from Countryside Community Church. I'm the Director of Youth and Family Ministries, and I'm also a student at Chicago Theological Seminary. Um, okay, that seems good. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And uh, Imam Jamal, I'll let, have you introduce yourself and take it away. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Imam Jamal Dawoudi, um, the Imam of American Muslim Institute. I've been here for more than four and a half years, close to five years, and uh, yes, that's it. Thank you. Yes, and thank you. you. Uh, and, and you feel free to start when you're ready. I'm sorry to throw you on the spot. No Thank you problem. for... Thank you for coming. So did you give me the chance to, to join? Sorry, I just, I just changed that. Okay, okay. yep. Here we go. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. We'll be talking today about a prophet whose number is number three on the list of the 25 prophets that mentioned in the Quran. And we'll learn, we'll learn about his story. We'll see if his name came across the Bible in, in, any, in any way. Um, and I have a few slides that I would share with you regarding uh, the story or part of the story that is mentioned in the Quran, of course in English, and then uh, who are the, pro the, the definition of the prophet in Islam, and then the names of the 25 prophets. Then uh, we will have some pictures that uh, uh, show the estimate place of the nation or that big tribe we went when we say tribe but it was a huge and big tribe uh, of that time and then we closed with the kind of discussion amongst us inshallah so prophet hood peace be upon him <clears throat> the definition of prophets in islam the prophets and messengers in islam are individuals a human being who are hand picked up by Allah God to spread his message on earth and to serve as models of ideal human behavior and they are infallibles infallibles meaning in delivering the message they are infallibles they have not left anything that God revealed to them without delivering properly to uh, uh, to their people to their nations and in their own characters they are they represent the models of the ideal human human behavior <coughs> who are these uh, who are these 25s again these are the 25s mentioned in the quran it doesn't mean we don't have more of course we have more but these are the 25 whose stories being mentioned and circulated and spread through throughout the whole Quran. But at the same time, Allah told us in the Quran by saying there is no single nation that lived on earth was without a prophet or without a teacher, a prophet or a messenger. So the first one was Adam, that we consider Adam, peace be upon him, uh, also known as the first ever human being. He was a prophet. And we believe that Adam, is the one who built Kaaba, which is in the center of the big mosque in Mecca. And that is why Muslims all over the world in their prayer, the five times day prayer and their regular uh, uh, prayer, they turn physically to that direction in a way to celebrate and appreciate the first presence of God on earth. So Kaaba was a temple, was a mosque that Adam 
uh, worshipped Allah inside. The second one, Idris. The third one, Nuh. I'm reading that in, in, in the Arabic language. And you can refer to the English one. The fourth one is Hud, which is the, uh, <coughs> the title, the hero of our uh, story today. The fifth, Salih. Sixth, Ibrahim. Seven, Ismail. Eight, Ishaq. Nine, Lut. Ten, Yaqub. Eleven, Yusuf. Twelve, Shuaib. Thirteen, Ayyub. Fourteen, Musa. Fifteen, Harun, his brother. We consider him, as the Quran says, as a prophet. Sixteen, Dhul Kifil. Seventeen, Dawood. Eighteen, Sulaiman. Nineteen, Ilyas. Twenty, Al Yasa. Twenty-one, Yunus. Twenty-two, Zakaria. Twenty-three, Yahya. Twenty-four, Isa. And twenty-five, the last one, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. This is a chunk of the, of the story of Prophet Hood. The Quran is not like a book of stories, like you open the chapter from A to Z and you read the whole story. Part of each story is mentioned in different parts of the surah or the chapters based on the, uh, the, the point and the, uh, uh, the meaning that the lesson that can be taken uh, from that story and everyone has a certain taste when you read it you can learn something different than the other chunk of the verses so this is from chapter 26 saying that the Quran has 114 chapters varying from the longest in the beginning and the shortest at the end so in chapter 26 called Ash-Shu'ara we read part of that story God says and the tribe of Ad gave the lie to one of God's message bearers. When their brotherhood said unto them, will you not be conscious of God? Behold, I am an apostle sent by him to you and therefore worthy of your trust. Be then conscious of God and pay heed unto me. And no reward whatever do I ask of you for it. My reward rests with, the none, with none but the sustainer of all the worlds. Will you, in your, want, in your wanton folly, build idolaters, altars on every height and make for yourselves mighty castles, hoping that you might become immortal? And will you always whenever you lay hand on others, lay hand on them cruelly without any restraint. Be then conscious of God and pay heed to me, unto me. And thus be conscious of him who has so amply provided you with all the good that you might think of. Amply provided you with, with flocks and children and gardens and springs for verily I fear less suffering befall you on an awesome day. But they answered, it is all one to us whether you preach something new or are not of those who like to preach. This religion of ours is none other than, other than that to which our forebearers clung and we are not going to be chastised for adhering to it. And so they gave him the lie, and thereupon we destroyed them. In this story, behold, there is a message unto men, even though most of them will not believe in it, but verily your sustainer, he alone is almighty, a dispenser of grace.
then we move to the estimate of the uh, area where uh, Ad, uh, the tribe or the civilization of Ad, lived. <coughs> it is you know, based on the Arabia Peninsula, it is down half of the Arabia Peninsula down to the desert that we call it Al Ruba Al Khali the famous desert in, in uh, Arabia land, that desert is just a temporary, something temporary came up to that area. That desert bury underneath, according to many pictures that's taken in the satellite that we will see some of. Uh, the, the picture said that there are civilized, there is civilization, a big civilization buried under the sand. So where you see the blue arrow is the area around that area where Ad has lived there. This is a close picture from the satellite. It's showing uh, some of those balances that I will be talking about also. And you can see underneath a kind of pathways and streets and buildings still up till now buried under that under that sand so that is taken by the the satellite but it's not the one i was talking about i couldn't find that one which is taken by a special uh, lens now this is a better picture to estimate how the tribe used to live you can see on that drawing what it says, the town or the village, and you can see those uh, beads. They, they, they are called like beads, and these beads are the ventilation and cleaning uh, chimneys, if we can say chimneys, in order to clean and ventilate the water pathway because this area was not a desert. This area was full of trees, and rivers and streams. So they will be dragging and drawing and di uh, directing the water this way. And you can see those opening now in the sand up till now, as tall as they used to be up until now, you can see still the track of those beads. They call them beads. This is a better picture to those beads. And that tells us around which area the, the nation or the tribe lived. You can see now with all the sand that the sand dune that covered those beads, we can still recognize part of them, either very big or very small. And the next picture will show really how big the bead would be. Just look at that one in the corner down and see that man, how small he is. Uh, compared to the to the width of that bead, and in some areas they are covered. Some areas still can be seen. And this at that time it used to be very high, so it's not easy for anyone to go up and do anything, any damage or hurt. This is a picture from the top down uh, uh, on on the bottom of that uh, uh, bead. And of course, it's filled up to some extent with the, with the sand. That also we'll be talking about why it is sand, because that was their punishment. Now, in those verses that I have mentioned, either this uh, chunk of verses or others, that God has has favored them and told them that I have given you the power and the special size. They were bigger than the normal human being. And this is the footprint that is left or that is discovered in that area, a footprint. You can see the size of it. I think it's, it's more than 15, right? <laughs> now, this is a this is a part of the ballast or ballasts that used to build. Now 
they wouldn't build the flat, the first floor of the palace on, 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 the, normal, on the normal floor. They will go to the mountain, to a high mountain or high hill, and they will build the first level where they will be gathering and meeting at least 100 meters from the surface. And you can see this gentleman is trying to climb on the top of this is a mountain. This is not sand, this is mountain. And yet he's still climbing in order to reach that first level. That this is how much God has given them the power and the talent to build. Oh, all right. <clears throat> Now I want to stop the sharing, just get out of it, yep, thank you. So these are a few slides that uh, will help us understand the area and the, the power that God has given them. So the tribe of Ad is the first a tribe who worshipped idols after the flood after Prophet Nuh. Prophet Nuh died and from his you know followers and grand kids of the followers and great grandkids came uh, uh, Hud and during that time people were more inclined to worship idols. Allah sent a prophet from amongst them that they know his family, they know his lineage, they know his uh, uh, parents, his family, as I said, he, they know his morals and ethics, and he is speaking the same language, so he is not a foreigner that they can have any doubt on. And that, as I said, after the corruption and the worship of idols happened between the flood until uh, Prophet Hood. Um, interesting, in those verses, God addressed, when he addressed uh, Hood, he said, their brother, a brother from amongst them. And the word brother is to tell that he is trustworthy, exactly as a brother will trust his brother. And he will aim and look for all the good, exactly as your own brother will look for good. He invited them to worship one God, or the one God, the only God. And he also told them, this is for free, I'm not asking for return. Why? Because at that time, up until now, even now, we have the concept of the uh, reward for the benefit. And if you are going to benefit from something, you have to pay for it, or you might pay for it. So prophethood, in order to save them from those uh, uh, difficulties or hardships or burdens, he said, I'm doing that for free. He was hoping that they will believe and follow him. Uh, and he said, the only one who can pay me is God, the one who sent me. Now, <laughs> he asked them to ask for forgiveness for worshiping idols and to repent for, the, for their sins and for, for the mess that they have been doing. We want to say that God has tested them by giving them again, gardens, children, works, talents, power, uh, water, uh, all uh, uh, the beauties and the graces uh, in life, he gave it to them to the extent that they forgot about the creator. They got so much involved and attached to the created rather than noticing and appreciating the creator. And God told them, don't be cr criminal against yourselves. The way you are doing is, is like a crime against yourself. They opposed him. And they said, you did not bring any miracle that will prove that you are sent by God. They think or they thought that the idols benefit and harm people. And this is how they accused him of being or becoming crazy because he attempted to insult the idols by making the, all the gods as one God. For them, that's a crazy. And that craziness came from insulting their, their idols. They are looking just like some in our life. They are looking for a faith, a religion that has no responsibilities and no rituals and no obligation. 
So they were looking for that, and of course, the idols are the best, you know, for them to follow. The idols doesn't talk, doesn't ask for anything. So that's how they were following and adopting. Uh, of course, he responded back to them, "I'm not crazy," and that is to tell how uh, to tell about how how polite and etiquette is the prophet Hood and all the other prophets when they were rejected. They never insulted or uh, fought back in that uh, uh, when they were accused of being uh, criminal or being crazy. They said, no, we are not crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy and bear witness to me that I believe in God the one and I'm innocent of what you are doing. Then he challenged them with the few members that followed him and with the very uh, uh, short resources that was available in his hand, he challenged him that you will not be able to touch me. You will not be able to hurt me because I'm relying fully on God, the one who sent me. So they decided to leave him alone out of, you know, they gave up. They gave up. They just left him alone. Then after he reminded them, after he gave them the chance, after he discussed or, or, or elaborated and uh, uh, told all the evidences about the presence of the one God, it means he delivered his message fully. Then they were challenging, they came back to challenge him. You are talking about the one God, ask this one God to send his punishment on us so we can see if you are truthful or not. We want to say that the curriculum of prophets, all the prophets, those 25 and the others, are one. The curriculum regarding the belief system, regarding the ethics, is one, is the same. What differs is the environment and the nations or the, the, the societies. But the teaching is almost the same. <clears throat> That story of Hud can be, or will be, if you read the Quran, will be repeated in every single prophet that has been sent to human being. So, uh, they have, okay. so we want to talk about, then, before we come to the punishment, we want to say that, then why we don't see more than just a little bit of the uh, ruins from the tribe of Ad? Tribe of Ad was acting in a way, thinking that they would like to be immortal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extinguished them and, and destroyed them completely. Ad was, if you read those, uh, those verses, they were building uh, those water channels. They were building high and huge palaces. They were hurting others by being unjust and abusers. And in this, you know, they have crossed the line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not only about non-believing, but that non-believing led them to be that much arrogant. And all these characters that I'm talking about mean that they were going in being arrogant and looking down at others to the degree that they used to abuse them. We have the power, we have the palaces, we have the areas, we have everything, you are nothing. So they used to abuse others. So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them a tornado, I can use that word, a tornado in that area that lasted for seven nights, seven nights and eight days. Yani, if we can, if we say that the days is, uh, uh, the 24 hours is the day and night, so they took seven nights and a day, eight days, a consistent, huge, uh, very powerful tornado that destroyed all the people of Ad. And they have been buried under that uh, uh, area that we have been watching as a sand. So this area used to be garden. They used to be like paradise, it used to be heaven. But because they were looking for immortality in a wrong way, they were looking uh, 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 down at others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala flipped the situation and made that whole area a desert and the famous desert, you know, the biggest desert in the Arabia Peninsula. Uh, <clears throat> so they were stubborn by 
denying uh, Prophet Hood and his message, by denying the evidence that he was bringing, by uh, challenging him that if you are truthful, bring us then uh, the, the punishment from God. So the first gods made a kind of dry season in their area. So the plants and the corpse start fading down until it stopped. Water start fading down until it stopped. Then they have been uh, punished with the last uh, tornado that I can uh, talk about. And now what happened to uh, Prophet Hood and his followers? God told them a few days before that the punishment is coming. So take your followers and get out of that area. And this is how Hood, Prophet Hood was saved in that in that way. So this is the uh, this is the story of Prophet Hood, and would like to open it up for the questions. Let me see. It's okay. First one. Yes. So, go ahead, uh, Jeremy. Oh, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, I think that's it. that's it. That's a lot of uh, information and I really appreciate it. Um, I'm interested in what, uh, if, if anyone has any particular questions or, or any, anything that they've noticed um, that, that rings with them in some way from, uh, from what you've said today. Oh, I Are you asking me? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, well, go ahead, Dina. So one of the things I noticed when you were talking about it is that at least from the, the text that you brought, it sounds a little bit like the story of the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel, in this desire to want to, um, you know, become more powerful, become closer to, you know, to God and, and, and divinity. And the need to build a structure in order to do that. Um, and one of the, the Jewish commentators, Rashi, who's a medieval commentator, um, talks about the, the one of the reasons that that was like a, among the theology and, and all of the other things, another reason that was so problematic is because once the tower got so high, the it, you can imagine if it's you know a couple of miles high and you're carrying these big heavy bricks trying to make the tower taller and taller that it would take a full year it was said to climb from the bottom all the way to the top with a brick and so it got to such a point that um if somebody fell and like died from the building you know like as part of their their climb they were not mourning the death of a person they were mourning the fact that a brick didn't make it to the top of this building because the building became like the structure, the building became more important than the people and the relationships with each other and with God. And I wonder if that, like to me, when you were talking about this, this text, it brought that commentary and this connection with the Tower of Babel to mind. And I wonder if that um, brought anything for you. Well, uh, uh, so much similar all the stories of these prophets, uh, what they have brought to their people and the way they were rejected. And the consequence is almost, I don't wanna say typical, but very much similar. Like the uh, prophet Noah, Noah uh, the one that we studied a few uh, months ago, very much the same. He lived for a long life. He just asked people to worship God. And when we say worship God, we don't mean just the ritual. We are talking about the whole Sharia the whole teaching, the whole system, where people will be really enjoying living on this planet, on this earth, in heaven, before they go to the, to the next heaven. So when we talk about worshiping God or recognizing the one, it means recognizing his principles and his teaching that will allow you to live really happily and peacefully. And by rejecting that, it means that, no, we don't want to uh, be that good. And exactly what you said and what the verses uh, brought up that, they have been building, you see that picture of whatever left from that palace. And the guy was trying to climb to get to the surface of that, of that palace. So you can imagine. Uh, 
In another chunk of verses in, in, in the Quran, God described them as they as as God never created a powerful a group as much as them at that time. They were the most powerful in everything. Powerful in knowledge, powerful <coughs> in power, in uh, number of people, in building, uh, in prosperity, in everything. And yet, they did not want to give thanks and appreciate that from God. As you said, they have been so much involved with the created, whether it is the brick or whether it is the palaces or whether it is uh, what they have been uh, doing and that created the arrogance uh, aspect of them and that's of course that is the first uh, recipe for destruction and failure uh, I noticed a couple of themes that echo through a number of um, the stories from uh, Christianity, specifically uh, Jesus and John the Baptist, um, not necessarily involving as a structure that you can find on the on the map, but this idea of separating yourself from God um, by attaching yourself so completely to uh, earthly earthly things like wealth, able-bodiedness, privilege, these sorts of things. And so the message from, um, from the prophet, from Jesus or from John the Baptist of, uh, of reconnect yourself, because the further away you get, the more separate you are, not just from God, but from creation, from the environment around you, um, and from people around you. And so you are less thoughtful of how all of those things are connected and seeking out the divinity within, within, uh, all of creation, all of God's creation. So I noticed those. Is there, um, are those sort of the um, themes that you hear repeating through the different, through the different prophet stories? Yes, in a different taste, different flavors, and sometimes um, um, the punishment. And uh, I, I don't know if, if I would be understood properly when I say punishment as a key consequences of, of their, uh, uh, this attachment from from faith and God, uh, the consequences will be different. It was flood during Noah. This is the uh, hurricane. There was some uh, others uh, being destroyed with pebbles uh, carried by uh, birds, and 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 some of them were uh, diseases, you know, plague, etc. So the whole idea, and thank you for sharing, uh, Rebecca, because yes that is the importance of somebody being a religious person or attached or belong to a certain system because we have to give up uh, uh, selecting or going behind our own ideas and own thought of what is religion to the degree as these people of uh, Hood were thinking we are worshiping the idol. The idol is not asking us to pray. The idol is not asking us to fast, for example. The idol is not asking us to be nice. So since there is no obligations and no rituals and no commandments, that is the best faith. We need to go back to the reality, I mean, to the, to the root of how God wanted this human being and this planet to be built with peace, with harmony, uh, uh, through the connection with him through the connection with him. That is part of why it is important to be attached to a good faithful group in this life. Well, and it's interesting that use of the word punishment because I mean, we have the uh, examples of punishment, the flood, the tornado, but there's also punishment that um, could be perceived as the suffering that's inherent with that yes. disconnection. Right. Yes. Even if it's a, even if it's a storm or a flood or or something like that internally, there is an inherent suffering yes. that that happens. So the punishment could be severe at one time, just like we are reading in the story and could be gradual. Uh, thank you very much. What do you what do you what do I uh, think about the global warming? If it is not punishment, then what it is, it is. A, is it a gift from God that he is giving us? No. It is because we are hurting 
Mother Earth by our own hands. So we are harvesting the consequences of our own actions. Let the politicians say what they want to say. It is a punishment and we have to do something about it. So Imam, I'm curious, um, in, in all of the prophets in, in the way that, that you went, I think you said there were 25 and yes. that were mentioned in the Quran. Yes. Um, you know, I'm wondering, are they all people who foretell like critique and ask people to change and are the consequences always um, absolute or does behavior change in, in mean that like the consequences can be altered? Or is it that, that something's going to happen no matter what? Or is it a warning that if you don't change, then these consequences or these punishments will happen? Well, I will take the last uh, segment of your, what you said. Uh, there will be some uh, nation that will be changed. There will be some nation that will be changed. And the example is Prophet Musa and the Israelites. They got what they got in the Exodus, you know, in the in the Sinai Desert, uh, and then yes, the next generation changed and followed him and listened and 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 so they were not destroyed. Uh, followers of Jesus, the same. Followers of Muhammad, since he is the last prophet, also the same. They have tried with him. They have conspired to kill him and attempted so many times, but the prophet Muhammad did not push the red button as Prophet Hood or as Prophet Noah did or some other prophets did. He kept that as praying for their safety and for their uh, well-being, hopefully that they will be believers later. And this is what happened. Any other comments? Well, I have one question um, about yes. the list of prophets. Yes. Um, in order to make the list of prophets, does it require um, connection with a physical location that can be found, uh, can can be located and correlated with a with a map or or something? I think roughly I can say ninety five percent. In order not to be and in order to be scientifically correct, ninety five percent was in the Middle East, let's say going from Iraq, Prophet Abraham, to as far as to Egypt and, and the north to Turkey and maybe uh, uh, south to the Arabia Peninsula. This area took 95, if not the 100% of those uh, 25 ones. Yeah. I have one more question as well. If yes. no, I, I don't wanna step on if everybody else has questions, jump on in, but I'll keep asking. Um, so I'm wondering in, and Rebecca, I'm curious your, your answer to this too, has, is prophecy ongoing in, in Islam and in Christianity or has, is like, I you know that your list Imam said that Muhammad was the, the seal of the prophets is what you said. Yes. So does that mean that he was the last prophet and there are no more since him or is prophecy still an ongoing part of, of the religious tradition? He was the last prophet sent by God with a book. Now, do we have people inspired or people acting on the footsteps of the prophets? Yes, without claiming or, or pretending that we are prophets. We are good people. We are scholars. We are rabbis. We are imams. But we are following the footsteps of the prophets. That's always continuing. But for specifically a prophet sent by God, the way I, de I, I defined in that definition uh, about the prophet, Muhammad was the last one. That how, that's our narrative. Uh, from, a, from a Christian perspective, um, specifically uh, at, at Countryside, we, have, we live into this idea that God is still working in the world. So we are, um, well, I'll speak just for myself. I, I am, you know, looking for prophetic voices and prophetic imagination and, and prophetic signs con continued. Um, cause I personally find it difficult to believe that if God were still working, that the last story we would have would be, uh, 
you know, letters from Paul, I, I imagine had we been um, watching for them and writing them down and had it been okay to add new changing stories to our foundational text for Christianity that I think we would see there were more, um, more still happening and more widely accepted. So. Super interesting, it, it, because we also, in, in Ju Judaism, it's largely believed that um, the prophecy has ended. And the Talmud, in fact, says that the death of the, um, of the last prophet of, um, you know, Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, that it says the spirit of prophecy um, departed. And so we take that to mean that it's, it's not part of the way God communicates anymore. And from a Jewish perspective, we kind of look at the Hebrew Bible encompasses three parts. We have the Torah, which is the five books of Moses. And we have the books of the prophets, which are the, um, you know, is the middle section. And then we have the writings, which encompasses Psalms and um, Ecclesiastes and the book of Ruth and, and things like that. And if you look at it in a certain way, you can kind of see the development of how God interacts in the world throughout that the way we look at the Hebrew Bible. And so we have like God's direct conversation with um, large groups of people, like right, everybody at Sinai heard God um, and, you know, that and God interacted with Adam and Eve and Moses and Noah and, and Abraham. And then in the prophets, um, God interacted with one person at a time and um, the miracles of splitting the sea and things like that are, you know, became, um, not in the same kind of relationship. And then you get to um, the books, like the writing sections, Kituvim, where you have like the scroll of Esther, for example, where you can see God's presence in the world and in the story. But in fact, the, the name of God is not actually even mentioned um, in, the, in the book of Esther. And so um, this idea that, you know, prophecy has departed doesn't mean that God isn't working in the world. And it doesn't mean that there aren't people inspired um, to, to do and be holy, um, but the idea of prophecy and the way of the prophets of that section of, of the Bible, of the Hebrew Bible has ended in most of the Jewish perspectives. Well, I, I, go ahead. Somebody wants to, okay. I agree with the communication. Yes, God communicate with the human being in a, so many different ways. But it's not necessarily to call that human being a prophet, because that definition is very uh, 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 is very special for Islam. He has to have a um, a book from God or being uh, spoken to by God. Now um, about the the uh, the coming of the Messiah, <clears throat> the question in the chat box: uh, We Muslims believe that there is a second coming of Jesus. We believe that he is not dead, he is in heaven, and he will be returning at the end of the time, not to teach, but to fix what the human being has messed up with, whether they are Christian or Muslims or Jews or etc. That is how we have been told in our uh, uh, theology, in our narratives. He will be coming not to teach, but he will be coming to fix uh the situation and set uh the peace and right after that there will be the beginning of the day of judgment <clears throat> what was the question here thank you uh sorry i my my question is also um since you you described um prophet very well in islam i wanted to know if we if if the definitions are different or or similar in uh, uh, the other two traditions. Okay. Either. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> Rebecca and I think we're looking at each other. We're like, is it going to be you? Is it going to be me? Is it going to be you? I'll go. So, all right. So um, in my definition of prophet, and, and again, like I'll put a disclaimer that I, I'm not sure I speak for all Jews or all of Judaism, but the way that I interpret the role of prophet is that um, they're sent to critique the behavior of the community in an effort to um, precipitate change. 
and that there are consequences to not changing the behavior, but they're sent to the community, they're spoken to by God in an effort to sometimes be a very heavy handed critique of the community um, to inspire and um, motivate change. And, and we see that throughout the prophets in the, like the books of the prophets in the Jewish Bible. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. I feel like I would not have explained it that well, but yes, that is, uh, again, I also will give the disclaimer that I, I am not trying to represent all of Christianity, but the, the definition of prophet is, is exactly uh, what Rabbi Berzin has explained. I will say uh, about the second coming of Christ. Now that is not necessarily uh, uh, universally accepted across Christianity. Uh, some people do believe very much that uh, Jesus will come again, uh, exact uh, some, uh, I hesitate to use the word justice, although I think some people wouldn't hesitate to use that. I would hesitate to use that and say exact some sort of consequence uh and then uh you know the other end of the spectrum is that um that that we then are as followers of jesus we are supposed to be the second coming and so every time that we fall away from the path every time that we we miss that opportunity you know there goes the second coming of of christ so there's a spectrum on uh, on returning jesus I want to just comment on, on Rebecca's uh, answer. Yes, same wise, a group of uh, Muslim scholars in, in our theology interpret the second coming of Jesus, not physically, but the spirit of Christianity, that the true Christianity, the genuine Christianity will be back in a way to meet with the Muslims and other believers in God and uh, uh, resolve the problems and set the peace and then we will be uh, uh, going to the day of judgment. So we have that part of it too. Yeah. Do you have any resources on that or anything? I would love to to read into. Yeah. yeah. Ask, asking me. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. I, I will. I will send you some. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rabbi, could you speak to? Um, and this might be a completely ignorant question, but I, I'm just curious. When we talk about the the second temple and and you know second chances, I guess is kind of how I'm framing it. Do you see any correlations in how we or a spectrum of understanding of Judaism would speak to this kind of concept in in a similar or different way than Rebecca and Imam Jamal speak about Jesus? That's an interesting question. So, you know, this idea of a messianic, like Messiah in Judaism is, it's a Jewish idea. Is there, a, is there a Messiah and what does Messiah mean? Um, and there are some people in Judaism that believe that there is a person. So I, I guess, disclaimer, we, we don't believe, we do not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Um, we believe that there might be a Messiah one day. And there are some people, there is also a spectrum of belief, believe that it would be a person who is coming. And there are discussions about what the, the language around it is called like the birth pangs of the Messiah and what the um, con like sequence of events that happens in order to bring about the Messiah. Usually it's preceded by an era and a time of great conflict um, that the Messiah would then come in and help to resolve and bring peace. And some people think that it will be that that time will then create the opportunity for the, you know, the temple, like a, a different kind of existence and like the idea of the lion laying down with the lamb and, and things like that and create justice and peace. And, um, but in liberal Judaism, there's an idea that it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a person, that it's actually all of us working towards a messianic time um, where we, if we engage in the, um, in the work of, of tikkun olam, of putting back the pieces that are broken in the world, um, which is what tikkun olam means, it means repairing the world. If we work towards those kinds of 
justice and, and peace together by forming the relationships and building the kind of world that we believe um, is the world that we want to live in that would be um, all of the things we hope for with peace, inclusivity, and all of the pieces that come together that we can be partners in bringing about a messianic time or a messianic era. Um, it's not necessarily tied to one person. And in, when I speak about it personally, I, I talk about how all of us can be, um, if, if we want to believe and talk about this messianic era, that it takes all of us to achieve. I would like to add that uh, within our narrative, Muslims believe, some Muslims believe that uh, the verse in Deuteronomy 18.15 uh, 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 God's referring to the Messiah that the uh, the Israelites were waiting for. He was, we believe, he was Muhammad, not Jesus. Uh, you can read that verse and uh, just have some kind of reflection. But this is our narrative. So by 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 saying Muhammad was the seal of prophet, now all the stories, all the stories of the prophet, all the scenarios that uh, could happen in any uh, society or any time that has happened between Adam and Muhammad and that's why Muhammad included and concluded that building of faith of God and there was no need for a prophet like him to come the scenario has been uh, uh, experienced uh, and practiced and the teachings are there and just people need now to read and follow and commit and devote so that is that is part of my answer why any again that's 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 our narrative well what's so interesting about that is that all of these things can be true at the same time uh which is uh is a part of our our scriptural study for christians is that there are a number of times where jesus is believed to have said you know there's many houses in god's or many rooms in god's house my followers will hear my voice so while for a group of people jesus could be the messiah for a different group of people muhammad could be the messiah and uh for jewish people there's a different messiah and so it's it's neat that that can that that can, those can all be true like we can we have the ability to hold these uh apparently competing truths at, at the same time. How, how can you say that at the same time that many Christians believe that if you have not accepted Jesus in your life, that you'll go to hell? Well, I don't want to, I'm hesitant to judge other Christians, but it, it is connected to this story of the prophet and the farther we get from a connection an, an honest and authentic connection with the spirit, with God, uh, with the meaning behind our practices on our spiritual journey, those are consequences, right? And then actions happen um, that separate us further from, from people, from the environment. And so I would chalk that up to, to that, that, you know, the, the further away we get from God, the smaller and smaller our world gets, and the less room there is for difference and tolerance and for space to hold competing truths. So Christians are also trying to hold these com competing truths, because for, for, um, for some Christians who are unlearning some of those messages of <laughs> you're going to do this and then you got to go to hell, you know, there's, there's your internal library. And so when you challenge those, even internally, you, you know, you're you sort of, you, it's a, it could be a little bit nerve wracking or scary for people. And so it's work. Like it, it, it's work to turn away that easy thing. It's work to, to engage authentically with the spirit because as imam said like god is gonna ask you to do stuff and it's maybe it's easier to say to some people i don't really have to do anything because you're wrong and i am doing everything right i that is the best i can do because i don't actually believe that um yeah. but it that's what it appears from outside of that belief system of if you are fill in the blank, you will go to hell. I grew up in a fundamental Baptist 
um, that was very much, you don't believe exactly the way we do, you're going to hell. And by exactly, I meant within that fundamentalist Baptist tiny itty bitty bubble. It include, so any other types of Christians were all wrong and they're, you know, they're probably going to hell. And as I got out of that before coming home, I came across a cartoon that really kind of spoke to people's view of this from the outside is, you know, people new to heaven are being led around showing what's what in heaven. And they see the compound off that has really high walls and whatnot and looks very well, you know, fortified. And they're like, what's that? And, and be quiet as we walk past. Those are the Baptists. They don't know we're here. That's amazing. <laughs> well, Rebecca, you, you nailed it down, really. And with your smile, you, you smashed all of them without saying the name. So thank you very much. Yes. Would you like me to read that question, Imam? I read it. Yeah, what is the explanation for or significance of the statement that Muhammad is the last prophet? Well, um, the significance is that we will not follow or allow ex human being to claim that he is a prophet and misguide people. Uh, we have to stick and read and follow and believe in that last prophet. Uh, um, if we will keep the prophecy that way, uh, first of all, from the Muslim perspective, he is the last prophet and that's, you know, that's it. We are not uh, uh, debating theologically, but some of the ideas, some of the answer is that as you have seen after Muhammad, way after Muhammad came, so many people who claim to be a prophet and they misguided their people to so many of the uh, disaster and catastrophes. Uh, the, the true prophet is the one who leads his community to uh, good behavior, good life, peaceful life, and who will be able to take them from one point to the other. So on the day of judgment, they will be saved and, and you know, they will be in good in good stand there. So uh, for Muslims, it is important because right after Muhammad, we have people who claim prophecy, uh, like uh, the Ahmadi a group, uh, like the Baha'i group, and others. And other, I don't want to keep uh, uh, saying names, but these people or these groups or these sects, these new faith claiming that they have also continued the, the prophecy in that way. Uh, for Muslims, it is it. For Muslims, for the Quran, this is it. And we consider the Quran is the final uh, uh, message of God that include the spirit and the teaching of all previous messages. There is no need to think of any new. We have enough uh, richness in our Quran and in our Islam to answer whatever new uh, uh, issues coming. So as I said before, the scenarios of the human being and the community, the human communities, societies being addressed through those prophets, whether it is in the Bible or whether it is in the, the Quran, those 25 uh, names. And that's what is important for us to take care of and to avoid uh, to, to, to consider the good, to avoid uh, the bad of that uh, behavior and to march, you know, properly to God. Thank you. What, what other questions do we have uh, from the panelists or the audience? Or any comments, anything that uh, this conversation has raised for you? Okay. What happens if there, what would happen if a, a book were found, discovered that occurred after Muhammad 
uh, but met all of the criteria for a, for a, a prophet in, within uh, the structures of Islam? What, what like, then, how would that be, how, what would happen? Then what will happen is that we are, we are destroying the message that been surviving for 1,443 years because the Quran itself says that Muhammad is the last prophet. So when you come after that and say, this is a book, this is a, from God, uh, we can verify so many of its authenticity, but it cannot be revealed by God. We, we fully and truly believe Muhammad is the last prophet that is sent by God and the Quran is the last uh, book that being sent by the Quran and we believe that the Quran include the spirit of the Torah and the spirit of the gospel. Do we have any other yeah. any other questions or comments? Actually, um, Imam, I I see this quote, and I obviously and I'm the, my question is more about the, um, the actually the first first part. What does that mean? Uh, and I know it's out of context a little bit, but uh, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. That happened. Uh... When, when there was uh, a claim uh, that Muhammad will not die and he is, that's out of the love of people to him. So God is teaching the followers of Muhammad through the Quran that no, Muhammad is a human being and he is not a father of any uh, of you, meaning that he did not leave sons, you know, children, male, that may think or somebody would say, uh, these children will inherit and continue the prophecy or that message in, in them. Uh, so God is teaching the Muslims ahead of time that he is a human being and he will have his day. He will die. So if he dies, it doesn't mean that the message stopped. It doesn't mean that you go back and live on your own. We just take the case and take the message and take the mission and we continue with it. So it's more, more aff affirmation to the humanity of Muhammad and that what will happen to others will happen to Muhammad. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions tonight? Well, well, I'm giving you a minute for that. Um, if if you would be so kind, we would really appreciate you. Uh, anyone here filling out our annual impact evaluation? Um, it takes it actually takes about ten minutes, but uh, but it'll. Help you think about how has uh, tri faith impacted you? Um, how can we improve, etc., um, over the last year? That would include our speakers. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, everyone can do it. Um, and, and anything you can do to get any of your followers to take the impact evaluation, whether they are fans or foes of the work that we're doing, um, feedback is good. Please. Thank you all. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. I, I think it was really great. And it was, it was nice to see you all uh, engage with each other. Thank you so much. Thank you very uh, much, Jeremy. Thank, thank you, you for inviting us. Dina. It's good yes, to see thank you, you over the Zoom, Dina. <laughs> nice to see you too. All right. Thank you, everyone. everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Take care, everybody. <laughs>